Builds, every upgrade you make makes a difference. See Energlaze.ie. You ain't shit! I wish I was 50 years younger you and I'd care. kick your ass. My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not lies. Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. All right, you're very welcome along to our Saturday panel, joined in studio by Gavin Cooney, sports writer with the 42.ie, our very own Moore Trassini Callig, and freelance journalist Owen Butler. How are we all doing? How are you? Very good. It's been a long week of celebrating, Owen, has it? Mayo's It was about half success. an hour of celebrating, I think. Oh, really? Well, yeah, it was very surreal, I have to say, when the, when the game, when the mayo Kerry game ended, because... The the green and red of Mayo came over the came over the thing, and that was a moment that I'd envisaged. The national title. It was the moment that I'd imagined so many times, but I never imagined it uh, particularly happening in March. So it was <laughs> the euphoria was kind of on the pitch in the in the stand. Everyone was kind of like halfway turned, you know, like one half kind of wanting to stay and, and be part of the celebration, but the other half going, "It's really cold, and I want to get back to the car, and I want to go home because it's." You know, it was it was only the league, but I suppose players like Andy Moore and Keith Higgins, you really couldn't be grudged. I don't think anyone on earth deserved it more than they did. So yeah, it was. I it was thought a I heard day. there was grown men in tears. Well, not where I was. <laughs> no. There's only one person in tears at the end of Allianz League Sunday. Yeah, there was. maybe yeah. they yeah, found him, was. did they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe he'd been in the pub for a while. But, but no. obviously, you weren't you weren't in tears. No, because we even did go to myself and my friends went to Gills afterwards. But it was a real like one pint and like, listen, yeah, we we'll see you. You know, so it was not booking, uh, booking a couple of days off work and traveling down. No, no, bar. there wasn't. Well, my plan for the All Ireland is yeah, you'll see me when I see me. I could be back in four <laughs> weeks or something. I love the optimism <laughs> of Mayo people. My plan for the All Ireland. Well, it's been my plan every year for the last ten years. It's never actually come to fruition. But yeah. Yeah, I was making that point on the football show with Shane Stapleton during the week. He was asking about Mayo supporters and why Mayo people think they were so great as much as anything else. But I was saying one of the great things about being a Mayo supporter, particularly since James Horne first came in, was mm. you could pretty much plan your entire summer yeah. along with, with the, what the team were going to do. Well, they'll be playing in Crow Park this weekend, this weekend, this weekend. So I'll make sure of nothing on because everyone will be up. Yeah, well, after the game, I was talking to someone that you would know, um, Tracy, and she... She was asking me, you know, and I, I realised she didn't know I'd bought a house. I didn't know she'd changed jobs. And I realised, how have we not seen each other in so long? And then realised it's because we didn't have any <laughs> games last year. So normally we would have been at, like, you know, all these other games and so we would have kept up with each other. So I hadn't I realised I'd seen her in two years. to meet yeah. up with your old friends right? <laughs> yeah. because literally Cause you'll, every you'll three weeks them, you'd yeah. run into them. Yeah. yeah. That was the heartbreak of Newbridge or Nowhere. Yeah. yeah. So you're obviously very optimistic about me on making it past at least into the Super 8s then, are you? This year? Yeah. Oh, I'm confident we're going to win the All Ireland. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not how it? Oh, God bless you. That's all I can say. Just God bless the pair of you. I just love this optimism, despite being kicked year after year after year. Here yeah. you both are, still smiling, still planning your post All Ireland. What's wrong with optimism? There's nothing wrong with optimism. So we've got to. Because, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, get, I get the sense that people have a problem with this optimism. Well, no, I don't have a problem with the optimism. And before anybody accuses me of being a bitter Galwegian in well. here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> like, I have no problem with the optimism, especially because there is reason for the optimism. But I always say Mayo are the most consistent team since the 90s. And they've consistently overachieved. And I mean that because... I'm waiting for the boss. <laughs> just loved a grenade across no, the desk there. No, when I say they've consistently overachieved, they have great players, but they've done, up until this year, they probably didn't have the full panel they needed of great players. So to have gone as far as they did so consistently was a massive achievement. And I feel that sometimes the fans and the supporters may put a little bit too much pressure on them. I feel. No, well, I mean, I, to me, to, to, as far as I'm concerned, it's a massive turnaround, not even since Newbridge. It's a massive turnaround since a month ago. You know, Mayo... I was at the the Dublin game where they were pretty abysmal, the Galway game where they were better but they weren't great, and everyone that I was talking to was talking about a rebuilding year, was talking about let's focus on 2020, and um, then the month of March came, and it's kind of the, the expression about coming in like lions and going out like lambs, it was the opposite, they came in like lambs, no one gave them a chance, and they had a series of unbelievable performances. Mm. Um, I mean, a lot of people were talking about Tom Parsons being, you know, security wouldn't let him onto the pitch after the game on Sunday. I was thinking, it's, it's Matty Ruan's not going to let him on the pitch when, <laughs> when he recovers from injury, because I can't see anyone taking Matty Ruan's place off him. And um, other players, I mean... In the first half when we were chasing the game and we had solid goal chances that were hand-passed over the bar, mm. 
Then Kieran Hunter-Ritzy comes on, a player that, you know, not many people outside of Mayo could pick out of a police lineup, gets the ball, <laughs> coming through on goal, at exactly the moment, in injury time, when all he needed to do was hand-pass it over the ball, bar, and he just side-foots it into the net, and I thought, these, I mean, really, really good prospects have just come out of the woodwork, and I would be positive. I would hark, though. I have a friend, I've known her for years, she was in college with me, called Aoife. She did, she's from Kerry. She goes to all the Kerry games, and she put up, congratulations, Mayo, well done, you deserve the victory today. A word of warning, though, no All-Ireland has won before the summer is spent. Ah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm only codding when I say <laughs> that I think we're going to win it, but <laughs> I had a friend from Kerry who was sending me messages on WhatsApp about Ro Robbie Henley, saying, you know, Ro Robbie, uh, you know, basically saying, Kerry, we're going to, uh, we're going to walk the game on Sunday, and I think his phone must have run out of power after the game because I, did, <laughs> I didn't hear from him again. It was funny. <laughs> 53106 is the text number. We're live on all our social channels as well if you want to get in touch, uh, if you have any comments at all for the panel. The Mayo players have sort of gone to ground this week. I know Jason Doherty did some media duties, but aside from that, there was, you know, James Warren wasn't on this show or none of the players were, and they weren't really around the place, and there was no great sense of celebration. I didn't see the trophy landing back into mm. Castle Bar. Is that, a, is that a good thing? Should you not? Enjoy a national league success, and maybe they have they privately. I think they did enjoy it. I, I think that day, laugh yeah. the pitch and stuff on Sunday and stuff. I think that's that enjoyable enough? enough for a league. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember actually in 2017 when the Galway Hurlers won the league. Uh, they just they won, picked up the trophy, went home, and there was a bonfire. I think in Kilcreast, people were welcoming home mm. uh, some of the St Thomas's lads because I think Brooke was the captain at the time or whatever, and uh, they were getting the excoriated for attending a bonfire. People saying congratulations, well done, you've won the league. If you can't celebrate winning something, it might not be the biggest prize. But jeepers, if you can't have a few hours of taking claps on the back, there's something gone. I I went to see Kerry when they won the league, this is about 15 years ago against, I think it was against Galway, and Seamus Moynihan was the captain, and when he was presented with the cup at the end, he didn't even take it with both hands, he didn't raise it above his head, he just <laughs> lifted it like that went and walked away, I think that's what I would aspire to, it's, is like, it, is it's been that nonchalant. Is this Mayo learning from the past? Because I think it's in Keith Duggan's book House of Pain, they talk about you know this hysteria after losing all Ireland under John O'Mahony, and O'Mahony used to have to give these huge functions, and O'Mahony would have to stand up and give speeches, and he was I think it was in Keith's book, he was saying, I'm going to have to stand up and talk about how I will win it next year in some swear word that I probably can't say in the uh, uh, on air, um, he really kind of detested it. So do you think that there is a, a deliberate playing down of it in Mayo? No. Well, Omani only lost one All-Ireland, but um, not, that's not saying that he won other ones, he only, only contested okay, so one All-Ireland. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, God, you don't get bitten that many times and not... But you know, at the same time, you enjoy winding people up like by saying, "Oh, we're nailed down, we're going to win." You know, because it seems to it seems well, to wind up. The like, final was insane. We spoke about yeah. this during yeah. the week. You were probably there. I was there. The team yeah. flew home to knock an airport, knock, and, we and were, my memory is there was about we 50, got the day of school. There. We were there. Yeah, we were there. <laughs> I thought you were. I saw that tweet. Was that? Were you not messing? Was that the first time you saw a plane? I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Where else am I going to see an airplane? Aside from flying overhead the odd time. Yeah. I'm sorry, I saw that. I thought you were missing. This is 1989. <laughs> you know? We weren't flying off to the south of France every Plus summer. we had planes yeah. going to the Iron Islands. Oh, well, next then. Well. <laughs> well, then the glamour. Ooh, la, la. I can't yeah. believe we missed yeah. out on yeah. such things in Ballyhonest. <laughs> <laughs> But that, but that probably that probably set the template for the following quarter of a century. Well, I think the time we're are, we are at our behind a losing team. I think the t the height of our kind of hubris was the mid two thousands. You know when. Um, when uh, Mortimer had the bleached hair and so did Kieran McDonald. Kieran McDonald had cornrows. Mm. I remember going into the, one of the Kerry games where, you know the, the railway bridge going over the road in Drumcondra had Colin Cooper and uh, Conor Mortimer faced off against each other. To come out after the game and see them put on the same <laughs> pedestal was a little bit uh, tough to deal with. But, uh, <laughs> this is the year when Con Conor Mortimer was paying tribute to Michael Jackson. It was like, yes. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. That was the cultural <laughs> level that Mayo were, were at. Like yeah. I think Mayo supporters are, are, are quick to believe, though, that next year will be the year. I remember after 06, actually, and 06 was probably the most humiliating all yeah. out of defeat. The late John Morrison stood up in the function at City West that night and gave it the big rabble rousing speech of, next year, next year we'll be back. And everybody. Believe it. Believe it, yeah. And nothing happened. I'm very pro that kind of hopeless hope. Is that a contradiction? <laughs> I quite like it. But, like, I mean, the world is so miserable. You might as well believe in it. I think Mayo people enjoy the misery. A bit like Mrs. Doyle making the tea. Yeah. I think maybe they like the misery. Plus, I'm from right? Longford. It gives Mayo people what? It's a sense of our, our because it gives you misery. a feeling. Because if you're from Longford, like you said, in fairness, oh you don't get many of so those days of like out. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have that heartbreak? Yeah, well, I, as to have that love to be up there in Crow Park on that day, to be following your team and to feel. Yeah. Well, as a writer, I know about three people who have books 
more or less written. <laughs> Are you one of them? But the final <laughs> shout, no, I'm not one of them. I was asked to be one of them. Thankfully, I declined that exciting offer because it was, all it needed was the last chapter, and the last chapter uh, has, has, never, has never arrived, until this year, of course. As a writer, is it a better book if the last chapter never arrives? And you have to write the book. Well, people have already, you mentioned the Keith Duggan book. Yeah, people okay. have already written the other books, so okay. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> How many new editions can you bring out of the yeah. same book? Do you think the hysteria, and as you said, there hasn't been much hysteria this week, and I know you do a lot of performance work in that, do you think that actually affects the players? Well, do you think no, Mayo have lost an All-Ireland Final because the fans have lost the run of themselves in no, the month leading up to it? No, I think Mayo have lost All-Ireland Finals because they haven't been good enough. And I know I won't be popular for saying that, because sometimes Mayo people seem to take that as a personal insult against a team. It is not. They're great players. Unfortunately, they were never a great team when they came to the All-Ireland Final. When you're coming up against the likes of Jim Gavin's Dublin, that kind of stuff, just the other team were better. That did not make Mayo a bad team. They mm. just weren't good enough on the day. Um, when you say, though, the hysteria, I don't know if I'd say it was contained because any other county, if they won that league final last Sunday, it would have been, like you said, lift the trophy at one hand, Yara, off home, forget about it. But because it was Mayo, it was a big speech, it was huge cheers, it was the emotion of the green and red of Mayo, it was two laps of the pitch. Well, no, in fairness, I'm just telling you, that wasn't the case. That I was the case there. for the players, but it wasn't yeah. the case on the stand. Yeah, but it was the um, case for the players, But, if, but in the case of the players, if they lost ten consecutive finals, you could see it would be cathartic for them. Absolutely, and no, but Would anyone saying. deny that Andy Moore and or Keith Higgins or any of these deserved the, the day I'm not saying they didn't, but what I'm saying is if it was any other team, that wouldn't have happened. Well, I That's mean, the Limerick saying. song was played. Mayo had no role in the song being played. That was played, no. Limerick Your Lady was played before, after the end of the previous and game. And Galway Girl so. was played after the Camogie. But my point is, is that when... <laughs> and our song is better than your song. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's written by a Galway band. <laughs> <laughs> so was ours. <laughs> anyway, my point is, is that when they won, they did do the laps and they enjoyed it. And I don't begrudge them enjoying it all, but what I'm saying is if it was any other football team winning the league on Sunday, it would have been collected and gone home. I'm not saying that's right, by the way, but mm -hmm. I'm saying Mayo do things their way. And I think that was their way of a dampened down celebration, but it was still 100% <laughs> more than any other team would have done. Mm -hmm. I don't begrudge them, but I don't think it's going to do any harm to them either. If anything, it might give them a bit of a lift. It now gives them a good, positive memory. That's yeah, all yeah I think the players uh, should obviously keep their feet in the ground, but I think everyone around the squad could should totally lose their minds because that's the point of the exercise. That's the point of sport. Yeah, there's a, it feels like there's quite a few similarities between the Mayo story and the Liverpool story at the moment as well, because a lot of the talk around what Liverpool are doing is that the pressure of Anfield and the nerves around Anfield and the weight of expectation of. 29 years and whether that's a burden on the players even though it feels as though you look at the results it probably hasn't shown it No, I don't think so Mayo and Liverpool kind of teach you the hopelessness <laughs> of the human condition um, I think I've decided that Liverpool are going to do it now uh, there's, just, there's just been so many moments this season it's been a very Man United way of winning the league not necessarily looking like the best team all the time but constantly getting these fluky late winners <laughs> to be honest I, there's, there's, sorry go ahead well, I was, I was going to say I, I think a lot of it is perception though and that's, I don't think I think comparing Mayo to Liverpool probably flatters Mayo a little bit but <laughs> um, the, the one thing it, in which it's similar is perception like if, if Man City won that game 3-1 last night you'd say yeah they conceded early but they were never you know the result was never in doubt it was because it was Liverpool it was because it was jittery and you thought you know when Mo Salah was through, I think everyone in the world thought passed the ball, um, except for me because I was in a pub where there was a you know a lag in time, so okay. half the pub were cheering, and I was like, hey, he's only barely got the ball. But yeah, no, I, th I think yeah, I, I was still with fancy City overall though. Unfortunately, yeah. I just think there's just been so many of those little moments, like Maris guy in the penalty, Sturridge's equaliser against uh, Chelsea from near the halfway line. Uh, there was obviously the late goal against Spurs, the, mm. the Pickford error against mm. Everton, like it. I don't know. It would be peak Liverpool, can I use that phrase, if the planets were to align and they were to still somehow not win the league. Well, well they could get to 97 points and not win the not league. Not win the league, yeah. What are the 82 at the moment, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. 81. 5 to go. Yeah, 82. Yeah. Which I think is as many as they got in the Suarez slash Gerrard slip season. There's a nice little symmetry now next weekend because the uh, Sunday games are Liverpool at home to Chelsea and Manchester City away to Crystal Palace. And if you turn your mind back five years ago, um, the Gerrard slip game was first, and then Man City went to Crystal Palace, and yeah, yeah, it was a great goal, and then, uh, then they went on to pretty much steal the league from there. Liverpool reserved a bit of misery for the, the three all against Palace. So those games are flipped around um, next Sunday, so yeah, maybe it's an omen. I'm not sure I buy this whole pressure thing, because I've gone to so many games, and they've given away an early lead, and they always come back. Mm. That, to me, shows a team that's not under pressure. 
it at all. I just, I think that's a story that people like to create around them. I think for the first time in a long time, they're very, very comfortable in their own skins. Like, and I think that's all to do with Jurgen Klopp. In what way? He just rela He's relaxed. He's relaxed. He, and I think he seems to be like the first maybe manager there who trusts them. And like he, you get the feeling that he trusts them to do what they feel is best. For example, I get the feeling that when Mo Salah went on that run last night, that other managers might have been screaming, pass the ball. But he had, he'd been given subliminal permission by Jurgen Klopp to do what you think is best because he trusts his players. And that creates an enormous amount of trust in yourself and confidence and belief. And it, it feeds into the group. And you can just see they've grown. They, they've been less Liverpool-esque. Mm. I, I think a part of that as well is that there's more leaders distributed tr throughout yeah. the team. So if you go back five years ago to the last league title assault, it was more or less just Gerrard. Suarez was a leader on the field, but he didn't speak English off the field. So the media and everyone identified it with Gerrard. Whereas now there's leaders, I mean, they can afford to leave the captain, Jordan Henderson, on the bench. Milner is a captain. Like they have this kind of four captains policy, theirs too, and then Wijnaldum and, and Van Dijk as well. I think that's a big, a big help to it as well. Like, do, does the, world, the, the football world want Liverpool to win the league? I, mean, I think so. I think, I think this, so. where I was last night, there's no way everyone in that pub was a Liverpool supporter. I think oh, they have all the neutral support, definitely. Yeah. But, yeah, it's uh, a real, real underdog tale. Not the Manchester yeah. United supporter, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Mayo or a shower of Wingers is a good start to a text from Beefy. <laughs> Every time I meet a Mayo person and they find out where I'm from, Meath, they moan about the All-Ireland they should have won. They didn't win it, so get over it. That's easy for you to say, Beefy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see his point. <laughs> well, what did Lee McHale do? Nothing. Nothing. They not to go over all ground. Wow. Well. <laughs> but there was about 30 people could have been sent off. They sent <laughs> off our best player and their worst player. I'm just saying, yeah. The Kildara Times on Twitter. Six days later and how Mayo celebrated winning the league is still being spoken about. <laughs> Christ almighty, it's a national title. Every side that wins it should be celebrating it. Mayo hadn't won it in 18 years. That's a very good point. Surely the only counties that wouldn't like properly celebrate it. The last time it. Mayo won it, Galway went on to win the championship. You pointed it out? Yeah. And we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> Surely the only teams who don't celebrate are Dublin and Kerry in football, yeah. Kenny and Hurling. Yeah. Everybody else properly enjoys it. They do, yeah. Which is right. I think it absolutely is right. Um, I, I would never disagree with celebrating anything. I think all wins, there's not enough wins in this world. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So when you do win, you should celebrate it. You should just make sure that doesn't contaminate your thinking and allow you to go off like a little balloon in the sky, which does happen to people. And the other thing is, if, if, if we had lost, they would have said, oh, Mayo bottled it again, and blah, 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 blah. So in some ways, we can't win. If we'd lost, they'd say we bottled it. When we win, they say, oh, look at you, it's got such a small-time mentality, you're celebrating it. <laughs> what can we do? Just win the championship, I guess. Yeah, I think that would be the obvious <laughs> answer to, to all of this. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're joined in studio by Gavin Cooney, by Maura Trassany Callig, and by Owen Butler, 53106, if you want to get in touch on our Saturday panel. We probably should talk about something else aside from Mayo. I thought we'd talk golf because of the week that's in it in the Masters, but none of you seem particularly excited. Are you uh, not counting I down like, the days? I like the I Masters. I do like the Masters, I just don't like it as much as you. <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> that's fine. I like, is it on the BBC this year? I actually didn't check. It's certainly all... All week is live across Sky. The BBC may have Saturday and Sunday yeah. back again, but the BBC's coverage has been shocking for the last couple of years mm. yeah. because they've done it off tube, so they haven't actually had people over at Augusta. So, I mean, like Ken on the course is so Ken, Ken, Ken on the course hasn't screen, happened near the course. Well, he just oh, wasn't there. Oh no! This is so. I used to like watching the BBC because it's the longest you'll be able to watch a live sporting event on TV without any ads. And Wimbledon. And Wimbledon, yeah, I guess. But I'm even talking about, you know, there'll be um, sponsors' logos around the court at Wimbledon or whatever. There's not really any at Augusta. Yeah, it's very pretty. Like they don't it's even really good it. in the eye. Yeah, middle-aged men walking around wearing chinos. It's, uh, <laughs> it's exciting. It's a real nail-biting stuff. Oh, but for sports psychology nerds like me, I love it for that reason. I, I would yeah. watch it all. If, if I had the time, unfortunately I don't. That's the trouble with golf. It takes too much time. So I can't really get into the intricacies of it. But I, I just love watching their pre-performance routines, how they're getting ready, what they're doing with the little gloves, how they're moving, how they're walking, how they're talking. And like I love trying to predict who's going to make this or he's not. And I'm usually right. Well, McElroy is interesting this year because he's been, he says he's been doing his own psychology based He's been reading a lot of self-help books. He's also been working with Brad Faxon, the pudding coach, which mm. is obviously key as well. But Faxon is a disciple of Bob Rotella, who's been key to Patrick Harrington's success. So maybe that's trickled down to McElroy. But it's been so notable over the past three, four months. Listen to every McElroy interview. Like it seems very amateur psychology, and that no matter what happens, he's speaking in a positive mindset because it's probably no sports person whose mood is more reflected 
on their face and their person. You think back to last year, was it the second hole in the yeah. final day? Misses a putt and literally the shoulder slump. Mm. And you just sort of knew it was over. And it was like an eagle putt as well. He still got the birdie. I think it might have put him level or whatever, but he's still in touch, you know? Yeah. It's funny with McElroy. His record at Augusta over the last few years has been pretty solid. I mean, I think he's... I think Generally top ten for each of the last five years. Always, yeah, yeah, last five years. And he's in insanely good form at the moment. I don't think he's had a, maybe one outside the top ten since January. So, I mean... Is this the year for him? I don't know. Well, it would be one of the greatest sporting achievements certainly any Irish person has ever managed to win mm. a career Grand Slam in golf. From your performance work then, McElroy's talked the talk all year and obviously his form He's walking is walk, reflective of yeah. that. But now it all comes down to this week where everything that's gone before will be sort of looked on very differently if he ends up missing the cut or not performing. Like, how difficult is it to do all that performance work in tournaments that don't matter as much as this one, where uh, his entire career will be judged on what happens in the Masters this week and every week of a Masters year that he hasn't won it. I suppose if you're organised about it, the way to approach it would be, it depends on the mindset and everyone's personality is different, but I think what I would do is I would look at those smaller, less important tournaments as little stepping stones toward this and looking at ways to maybe fix things, adjust things, improve mm. on things, keep doing things. But a lot of, like, sometimes people think sports psychology is this mystical way of, you know, saying self-help and wonderful things from gurus. It's not. A lot of the time it's actually having somebody to bounce ideas off, to be organised, to have somebody to make sure you have everything, to check off little lists. It's making you feel mentally secure that you're not worrying. You know yourself, even on a very simple basis, if you leave the house and you think you've forgotten something mm -hmm. and it's playing on your mind, you need to take that stuff away. And sometimes you do need a sports psychologist to teach you how to do that. Um, the kind of amateur psychology stuff can be a little bit worrying because you're not sure, just because you're reading a book doesn't mean it's right for you. But he seems to be doing all the right steps for him. Mm -hmm. But definitely the body language thing, that's a big thing. Like I could spend a long time working with an athlete about trying to get them to get their body language right because if your body starts moving one way, your mind starts thinking it and vice versa. So you have to be very, very careful. So you're trying to teach people to control alt delete and you're trying to find their triggers mm. to help them control out the leash. So that's where the pre-performance routines come in. Eric Dunvin was very interesting on that during mm. the week. Uh, he was in it. You should, if you <laughs> haven't heard it, you work, should yeah. uh, listen back to it. He was in studio with uh, <laughs> Joe and Andy Lee. It's up on offtheball.com right now. And he was talking about some of the performance work he's done over the last while as boxing with a smile on his face mm. to ease the tension yeah. and how it's such a simple thing that he'd never realised. Like, why would, in the 10th round, would you have a smile on your face? Mm. But actually the impression it gives to your opponent, but also just the general <laughs> good feeling it gives to yourself, the endorphins it releases, yep. that all right, even though I'm absolutely shattered, I've some, still somehow got a smile on my face It's here. literally faking it till you make it. When you're smiling, you, you're you under less pressure. When you're when you're grimacing, like you've got like muscles here at the side of your jaw, and that's clenching up, and then your jaw clenches up, and then when your jaw clenches up, your fists clench up, and then all of a sudden your sympathetic nervous system is going crazy, and your, your mind has gone into fight or flight. That's Sounds like no watching mail. <laughs> <laughs> that's not where you want to be when you're, in the, when you're in the 10th round you want to be relaxed you want to be cool you want to be calm you want to be collected you want to be seeing what's happening all around you and that's why Eric Donovan was able to get uh, Stephen McAfee with that left hook got him right under the ribs that was you know game over uh, mm. uh, you know at that point Eric Donovan then had won the title just something else on Rory like any time you read an interview with him he's at pains to point out that I don't define myself by my golf career, it's just a part of my life. And obviously it'll be a media thing to define himself, especially the week of Augusta, yes. because he's on the verge of the Grand Slam, and you know, you do worry at what point does that green jacket become a kind of a millstone. So why, what are the advantages from his point of view of, like maybe he doesn't actually believe it, but the point of even saying it, that the golf career is only one part of my life. Whereas obviously in the media and sports that's media... Really, that's we'll the healthiest way to be. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Like, sometimes I do hear people saying, has he lost it? Has he lost it? I'm thinking, well, we don't know what his main motivation is. He got married. He does a lot of charity work. He has a lot of stuff going on outside of golf. He may happen to be an individual who's fantastic at golf and use it as a vehicle to become this happy place he is now. Like, I don't think... Sometimes I think we see to... We label people, we see Rory McIlroy golfer. That might not be what he is. Mm. And that's up to him. And, and I do sometimes think that, therefore people say, oh, he's lost it. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe he's performing to the best of his ability because that's how much energy he's putting into it. We don't know this. Part of the problem for McElroy is that from a very young age, he was being compared to Tiger Woods, yeah. mm. who anybody who has read the recent book about Tiger would know it's not a not a, an advisable way of bringing up a child <laughs> the way Tiger was brought up. Or it's certainly, and as he grew into now, not an advisable way of living your life. His absolute obsession with the game, of with himself, how just his general despicable behaviour with women, with his friends, with his business mm -hmm. associates, no matter who it was, but golf was his sole motivation. Nothing mattered. Was it golf or was it success in being number one? That's well, what I do wonder. 
being number one at golf, yeah. being successful at golf, being the best there ever was. And everyone wants Rory to be like that. So when you hear Rory say, well, actually, I have other priorities, mm. you question, well, then you don't really deserve to be <coughs> number one, do you? No, I think he deserves it more because he's shown he's a good, rounded individual who's got other things, strings to his bow. But that do we he's want our golf. sports stars to be yes. good, rounded individuals? <laughs> I do. I want them to be brilliant. No, no really. I want, them, I want them to be rounded individuals because if they're not, it opens <coughs> up the door to terrible psychological issues and problems and bad family life and things like Tiger Woods getting beaten up at the golf club by his ex-wife. Do I want Rory McIlroy to win 10 majors or have a... I want Rory McIlroy to be happy. With three kids. Well, that's th I think it's two different things when you're a sports fan. The quality that makes someone a great competitor, and it would be unfair to name out the people that spring to mind, but you could probably guess the people that absolutely leave everything on the field. But then when you look at it a little bit more balanced and say in the case of a man, would you go like, would I like my sister to be married to that person? Mm. Maybe not, because that's someone who sees the game as the be all and end all of anything is not a very rounded person. So what works on the field maybe doesn't, but that, that, that's the same in any field. I mean, someone who's completely focused on success as a musician or as a writer or as an actor is probably the same thing, you know? It's not good for you, like, to be that focused on one thing and often if things are going well off the field you will start performing better and maybe this is what we're seeing with Rory now he is he's been very consistent I know people say oh he hasn't done this he hasn't done that but he seems to be enjoying life and that's probably leading probably will lead to more longevity I think if he'd kept going the way he was he'd have burnt out a long time ago mm. it probably takes quite a while as well to get the balance right so maybe actually for a couple of years there when he just met his wife and moved into a different part of his career, moved over to America, left his old life behind, very much sees himself, I think, almost as an American now, that he goes too far, doesn't practice quite as much, and then actually you get comfortable in that and you think, all right, I'll be defined by my family, but also publicly I'm going to be defined by golf career and I'm going to have to reassert myself into this. Mm. Yeah, it's always an unflattering comparison when you had like Jordan Spieth making a thousand puts a day, mm. as he really struggling, struggling on the greens. Yeah. Well, maybe the fact that the golf career is longer is also a factor. Because if you're a footballer, you could go, look, I'll focus on this for 10 years and there's time for everything else after that. The fact yeah. that golf players go on longer means that you maybe do have to come up with an accommodation between the two. Golf must be one of the more difficult sports to actually maintain your focus over a long career because you look at the money now. If you're a top, certainly a top 50 player, even a top 100 player, you're a multimillionaire. Mm. You're set up for life. In a sport where you don't need to be ultra fit, I know it's changing and they are becoming mm. fitter, but you can go and enjoy yourself. You probably play 22 tournaments a year, which means you've got half the year off. You can disappear for two months. You can go off to the Middle East and enjoy life. You can go to Vegas and mm. have a good time, whereas the vast majority of sports people actually can never do that. No, yeah. they can't. Yeah, As you say, they've got their short 10-year spell where yeah. you know, it's all or nothing. Yeah. yeah, no, it's so true, and that's why the challenge of the psychology behind golf is probably one of the mo most challenging sports, I would imagine, you working with actually when I was down in UL I was studying under Mark Campbell he's done a lot of work with golfers like he's got shed loads of it and um, it's just the mindset of a golfer you have to work with them out of competition preparing for competition in competition when the competition week and then the debrief and to go through all that again and it has to be a year-long process because like you said just left to be working I'm sure they're still doing little bits here and there even when they are enjoying life in Vegas or whatever or mm. off with their families or like do listen to an interview with Pori Carrington like you just hear there's a lot of internal mental gymnastics going on there the whole time like I'd be exhausted sometimes listening to him and imagine that in your head when you're trying to go around to do how many rounds of golf in a competition would you ever meet a sports person who wants to work and wants to delve into the mental side of the game and go actually you don't need this. This is the last thing you need. Because Harrington, so Harrington and Bob Bertella, Harrington went all in. Mm. And as you say, would happily sit here for two hours telling you every little thing he's learned and telling you where you're going wrong and going right in your life and no problem at all handing out advice. Whereas actually, you, like for McElroy, you would have always thought, well, that wouldn't suit McElroy, that level of detail. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it takes, you need to know what works with people. And there are times as well where a certain psychologist will not work with a certain individual because the two personalities clash. And you might work great with somebody else, but somebody else is just not going to bounce mm -hmm. off you. Some people's like trying to bounce a shlither off a haystack. But I think everyone needs a bit of it, even <coughs> ourselves. Like, I think it'd be, it'd be remiss of anyone to say, I don't need any kind of psychological support in my life in any way, shape or form. Um, there's always room for improvement, or at the very least, sometimes room for maintenance. Like, y y the mind is a muscle too, so when you see people going to the gym four or five times a week to maintain a certain physique or to keep a certain fitness up for a certain kind of sport, and they say, I don't work with psychologists, I'm thinking, that's the last <coughs> half inch that you're leaving behind on the table. Why aren't you doing that? Lads, golfers have to be the most mentally weak sports people of all. <coughs> week in, week out, the players in the final group have a meltdown. That's what made Tiger so good. He was able to convert. Golfers are more mentally weak than if your anything, average sports person? If anything, they're more resilient than most athletes because so. they're alone <coughs> as well. 
Yeah. It's the most exasperating sport in the world. Yeah. It's been making happy men very old for God knows how long. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I think golfers are one of the most resilient athletes, especially because they're out solo. Okay, you have a caddy with you, but you're still you're on your own, at least when you're on a team. If you're losing with Mayo, you've got 14 other men there losing with you <laughs> or winning and having a great day and you get to share. Like The joy when you win something as well, you get to share it with the team is amazing. I think when you're a golfer, when you're by yourself and you're alone and you've won something... And you're not competing directly against anyone. If you make a mistake, it's yeah. all completely down to you. Yeah. You've nobody to share the blame with either. You know, like you know, Sometimes if you have a bad day and somebody goes, oh, look, we're all in it together, but when you're alone... That's a very, very hard thing to carry, so I would absolutely disregard that text message. They're the most resilient people out there. Hey Nathan, I know you're a golf nut, but do you not think the majority of top golfers come across as assholes? Professional footballers take a lot of <coughs> from being costed billionaires who are detached from reality and add to that privileged, arrogant for the golfers. It's hard to get too excited for them as much as I like watching the sport. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But the Irish lads are saint. <laughs> Larry talks about Offaly all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Irish people have a sort of strange relationship with McElroy though. They do. Because and I think I'm it's, saying it's that like, if he wins the Grand Slam, <laughs> what an accomplishment it would be for an Irish sports person. <laughs> Yet still, I think if there was a national poll once again of Ireland's favourite sports person, McElroy wouldn't finish in the top five. Is that because he has too much money? Is that what it is? I think it's because McElroy has refused to be what everyone wants him to be. <laughs> he identifies as Northern Irish. He's never He's been... He's got an ambiguous attitude yeah, to Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it could he won't wrap, his, wrap himself in the tricolour. Exactly, but even it comes back to this idea that we desperately want this guy to be the, you know, to win more majors than Tiger Woods or Jack Nicklaus. And he really doesn't seem as motivated by that as... All the rest of us are. And he's just, I hugely admire him because he's grown up in the public, in the public consciousness and has consistently refused to be what anyone else expects him to be. And he does a lot of charity work and stuff that just people seem to like to forget about. And he did so much work for the Irish Open as well. Like, and then, do you remember the hoo-ha there a few months ago and it was announced he wasn't going to go to the mm. Hinch? Like, oh, has he forgotten where he's come from? Well, without him, it wouldn't be there this year, perhaps. You know, I just think he doesn't get enough kudos, I think, for what he's done at home. Yeah, he, he literally can't win with a certain yeah. section of, yeah. think, of Irish And the, the, Olympics, he, the Olympic stuff, definitely. The Olympic thing, thing as well, well, yeah. That was the big thing among that. Well, the strange thing about that was Shane Lowry took the same option. Yeah. yeah. But after he did, though. And, well, McElroy, I guess that's maybe where McElroy's fame worldwide is different to most Irish sports people. Mm. He took, took it on the chin for pretty much every other golfer who didn't turn up. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. So who's going to win the Masters? <laughs> Asking who's going to win the Grand National. No, I think I'm, I'm going to make a very bold prediction and I'm going to say the one golfer that we've talked about and Rory McIlroy. I'll leave that hang there. You know, I think, I think, no, I think Rory will win. Okay. I hope Rory will win. No mention of Becky Lynch main eventing WrestleMania tomorrow night, says Paddy and Tip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can come up with the one sport I know less about than golf. <laughs> come on, Gavin. Oh, I know. Don't, I don't know wrestling because I'm young. I'm, uh, that was way before my time. I'm young. I know, I don't you don't know wrestling because you're young. No, but sorry, don't, saying expect, rest don't expect me to okay. know wrestling. I mean, right. the glory days were seemed to have been WWE on Sky One, and my man never let me watch it. It was really bad, you know? Um, I'm also young, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, don't I saw the clue. John Oliver segment about, about, about wrestling last uh, last Sunday about the um, the way that wrestlers are treated and the way that and I suppose coming from the background of not knowing anything about the sport except for this, but that so many of them in their forties and fifties die and they're re treated really, really shabbily. They take like really bad injuries and they have no you know health insurance. They're not um, they're not protected. A lot of them have al alcohol and drug addictions after they retire. So that kind of puts a bad uh, a bad. Gives me, yeah, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth in terms of enjoying it as a spectacle. Yeah. Uh, finally, a couple of texts in, and we want to talk about this as well. It was a very bad week, and been a bad few weeks, uh, yet again, uh, for sport in terms of racism. We saw in Italy this week with Juventus, um, Wazi Kane, uh, been abused by the calorie supporters, a crowd and a venue and a support that seems to have had consistent problems over the last two or three years. With Paddy Agnew on the show talking about this on Thursday night and Leonardo Benucci came out and said, well, listen, he celebrated in front of them. The, the other thing you I, lo the thing I loved... for trouble. The thing I loved about Bonucci was he came out and he said that the blame should be apportioned 50-50. Mm. And then he said his statement had been misunderstood and I was thinking... Saying 50-50 is about the most specific, unambiguous <laughs> thing. How can you say, clearly, what's his argument? Like, clearly when I said 50-50, I meant 80-20. You know, it's like, it's, it's such a stupid, um, um, I thought it was awful, I suppose, as an Irish supporter, when I heard the 19-year-old striker's uh, surname was Keane, I thought for a second, it was a chance, maybe he had a grandfather or something <laughs> from Lahinch or somewhere, but um, 
I suppose that culture will change when people want it to change. I think Benucci's comment was just symptomatic. There seems to be an attitude in Italy. No one's defending racism, but they think it's a kind of a, well, what are you going to do thing. They don't take it especially seriously. I saw the, the Juventus manager said, made the point that the technology exists, if they were serious about it, to identify who in the, in the crowd. And not even like when you've got a bunch of ultras packed into a stand or into you know, the standing room. I remember when, maybe seven or eight years ago, England played Spain in Madrid, and it was the expensive seats that were making racist noises towards Ashley Cole, and I think it was um, Rio Ferdinand at the time. And there you could see it, I mean, clear as day, who the people were. There were people, you know, if there had been, if there was a serious will to tackle the problem, those people could have been identified and banned like that. But The Italian so football authorities have never been strong enough on it. They gave Inter Milan a two... They forced them to play two matches behind closed doors mm. under fans abused uh, Koulibaly of Napoli earlier this season. But even in that ground in Cagliari, Sully Montari, I don't, you, he played for Portsmouth back in the day, mm. he was racially abused and it, it was this drawn out case. And the, in the end, there was no penalty imposed on Cagliari because the Italian FA's uh, justification was, well, we couldn't prove that at least 10% of the ground were racially abusing you. Mm. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's yeah. one person. And like people will say, oh, don't punish the full crowd. Do. Do. I mean, because yeah. the, the way of eradicating this is for crowds to police themselves and say, you, if you hear someone making racial abuse in the crowd, or racially abusing someone in the crowd, mm. turn around and say, that's not all right. Yeah. We don't want you representing well, I me I and my it's, football club. It, it, maybe it's like a cultural thing. Because if you think about it, there are other things that are equally, in, or maybe not quite as indefensible, but, well, in the same ballpark. Think of really offensive chants at English games, which kind of are regarded, as even you know things that are anti-Semitic or uh, misogynistic or, all, or homophobic, but that are kind of considered part of the game. So I think it's just, I think the way that things change. If you think of, I mean, to take any example you want to think of, the Me Too movement, or you know, 15 years ago it was socially acceptable to smoke indoors, and people just decided, no, not anymore. Mm. This isn't right. And it's not like everyone was a big fan of it up till then. Mm. It was just that finally people said, now it's time to deal with this. We're not going to allow this to happen anymore. And that's when things change. And until that happens, things like Banucci's comments are only a symptom of, of that attitude. They're not, the, they're not the thing that's causing it. Would we be naive to think this couldn't happen in Ireland? I was Ireland? just going to say, you know, let's look closer to home here. I have, mm. in many a game, in many sports, I have come across racism, homophobia and misogyny. Sometimes misogyny directed directly at me. So let's not pretend mm. that we live in this Irish utopia mm. where we're all lovely to people. We're not. And I've heard racism. I've heard homopho terrible homophobic things being shouted at people in Gaelic games. And I'm not surprised why more people haven't openly come out and perhaps t discussed their sexuality. Why would you do that to yourself? Yeah. Um, and what would the reaction be of people around at those grounds? I just find, now again, this is only my own anecdotal evidence. Mm. Um, there'll be one or two people shouting, they could be quite aggressive, they could be quite loud. I know myself, if I was in the crowd, I'm not going to take them on because I couldn't, mm. you know, in case they turned on me for a start, for one example. So it has to become, like you said, the crowd have to say, mm. stop doing this, but it also has to become, and to be fair to GAA, they're very, very good at getting their message out there, you know, mm. give respect, get respect, all this kind of stuff. But unfortunately, until we as a culture decide that we have decided that we're not going to deal with racism, we're not going to deal with homophobia, we're not going to deal with misogyny. Like, the amount of men I have heard, for example, and I say this as a woman, they say the Me Too movement has gone too far. So you can't make a joke now. You can't flirt with anyone. I'm sorry, but if you're worried about your flirting technique because of Me Too, you're not that good a flirt to begin with. <laughs> but I do think it, it, it all, all these, and these aren't just like football or sporting problems. This is they a They reflect problem. what is happening outside <laughs> society. But all of this comes down to like, Everyone has a stake as a, as a citizen in a society to take a stand on it. Every, it's like the only way that these things are eradicated is like this mass movement of everyone accepting personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and that, like, that's just so important. And you can see that with the rise of right-wing populism right across Europe, like, there has been complacency there. And just to bring it back to sport, um, I know that Porter Carrington has always been kind of reticent to speak out on society issues and political issues because he says, well, what gives me the right because I, you know, I just haven't hit a little white ball into a hole. But I think as a citizen, everyone should be speaking out. And it's, it's more difficult to in sport, obviously. And it makes like this current England national team are an exceptional group of people, mm. I have to say. Mm. Raheem Sterling, like Callum Hudson-Odoi, and I think he's, he's 18 years old. Uh, 
years of age, yeah. after his debut was given, was saying how disappointed he was before the cameras. Danny Rose this week saying he can't wait to quit can't football. Wait to quit. Yeah. That's an unbelievable comment. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say, Gareth Southgate, because the worst thing about um, Ale- Allegri essentially just wanted to focus on the match, like he also kind of half blamed uh, Mozzie Kane and said, well, he's he should, a bit yeah. more mature. Yeah. Like, fair play to Southgate took responsibility and says, I, maybe I haven't done enough and maybe there's not been enough going on in England. And even this week, two, two or three days ago, there was an amateur cup final. Was it the Leicestershire Cup, I think it was called? A uh, cup final in England that was abandoned after 70 minutes because uh, the players had been racially abused and they walked off the pitch. So, um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of just repeating myself. No, but you, you, you do wonder when it does come to a head for English football because a lot of managers have said, well, listen, if the entire stadium was racially abusing my player, I would bring... Yeah, take them out. But it has but to become more than that. It has does it to need be to be more. the entire stadium? It, it needs yeah. to be the entire country, never mind the stadium, because this is why we have Brexit, for example. This kind of right-wing attitude, a lot of people not liking how the world is shifting. And for some reason, because we're allowed to jump up and down and swear and scream at football matches, because that is the great joy of sport, the solo sport, that you can go and forget you're an adult for a while and you can jump up and down and you can hug a stranger next to you and you can cheer. It also brings out the worst in us. And if we're not prepared to check ourselves... We have a problem there. And I don't think, like, okay, the FA may say, fine, okay, we're going to stop matches. That might stop the racism inside the stadiums. Mm. It's not going to still stop the problem. It'll just be on message boards. It'll be shout at people outside. So until we're prepared to stand up ourselves as a society... I suppose they they can't... Yeah, actually, no, you're right. Yeah, Yeah. society as a whole says this is unacceptable. But unfortunately, it's not. There's too many people. There's too many people getting media platforms as well to allow this alternative point of view, which is dangerous. And I think this is what's happened. We're allowing this to perpetuate, and it's very, very difficult to fight back against that. But I suppose the, in, in terms of sport, what I was going to say was, you're right about society as a whole, but in terms of sport, what they can really do in their purview really it. is just is the stadium. And that it and is to exclude it. people permanently who do make these racist uh, gestures, because there's no... Yeah. There's if no you exclude the stadium, it becomes a news item, it becomes <coughs> people discuss it, people start talking about it at work, people start talking about it in schools, that behaviour then filters down to society. And that's where sport, as we've seen throughout the years, sport a lot of the times can be leaders. This is a great place for them to do it. Because when, when, this, when the subject came up first, I was about to say that this guy Keane is going to go, he's only 19 and he's a brilliant footballer, but then it wouldn't matter if he was 34 and he had two left feet. I mean, mm. no one yeah. deserves that, <laughs> that, that, uh, that abuse. It's, it's totally unacceptable. You both touched on there, you were saying like there's obviously personal responsibility here and as individual citizens we need to call it out and take responsibility but the leadership side of it and Gareth Southgate's role in the transformation of that English team as personalities Mm. there must be so many players over the years with the English team who were vilified by the media who were abused on the pitch who never spoke out Mm-hmm. But possibly wanted to, but had managers there who sort of said, no, no, no it's it tabloid head. Whereas Gareth Southgate's actually empowered Raheem Sterling, mm-hmm. to who from five years ago when he was leaving Liverpool and been roundly abused for going and taking the money at Manchester City as they would have seen it, you know, was a quiet 19, 20 year old to flourish under, it seems more Southgate even than Guardiola, to say, listen, I'm, you don't need to be Colin Kaepernick in every time, but yeah. mm-hmm. to actually have the confidence to now take a lead take on the British media, which is one of the most difficult things any 23, 24 years, year old can do. Like, all of that seems to come from one man, from a, a manager, somebody in charge who says, actually, you know, your people, your personalities, go and yeah. stand up for yourself. Oh, no, Seth, I have to say, I'm, I, I really like Southgate, and mm. he's so impressive. I can think of no other national football team manager that is a better fit for that country's prime minister job. I, I, I mean, he should really be running it. I don't know whether we should... <laughs> I, I wouldn't thinking wish that on him now, in fairness. He seems like a nice man. Why oh, would you do that but, to um, him? <laughs> I know, so, yeah, he's, just, he's just very impressive. Uh, I've lived in this country from the age of two. My mother's a scouser, and even being schooled in Ireland all my life, I ended up with an accent, an English accent. Every game of hurling I played all the way to senior, I was called an English this, an English that. Not once did a referee, umpire, or linesman put a stop to it, says Conor and Westmead. I would believe that, yeah. Mm. And actually, as well, on a different level, I have been at matches and I have heard of matches where referees have given out to people that I know for speaking Irish while they play football at Gaelic games. That's a different kind of reverse thing, but like it just goes to show sometimes people latch onto things they don't have to latch onto and the bigger picture they don't. They're going right. to pick the easiest option. Yeah. All right, in soccer games, every time I've gone to an Ireland game, and. I'm confused why the cold crowd is booing the Slovakian number four, and it turns out he played for Rangers like eight yeah. years previously. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember I interviewed Torander Flo. He was in Dublin last year, I think, mm. and he was still talking about playing at Lansdowne Road, like what, 1996, I think it was. 
Like he still remembers mm. being booed because yeah. he was a Rangers Was player. it uh, mm. Shot Avaladze? His son was playing for Georgia actually okay. uh, the last night when Ireland were playing Georgia, but Shot Avaladze played for Georgia in Dublin as well. And you oh, really? would get uh, roundly booed for his Rangers <laughs> connection back in the day. Oh. I'm a lawyer in a technology company. I get paid a tiny fraction of what a golfer is paid. I work 50 hours a week plus commuting. My work is twice as demanding and many more times complex. And it's actually responsible work. Cry me a river, golfers. This conversation is absurd. That's a very black and white attitude to have. I'm sorry, like everyone, nobody can say my job is more important than yours or what I do is more important than yours. That's, that's... This that's guy's a lawyer in a technology company. I don't care. He doesn't entertain people for four days in a row. That in itself is responsibility. Yeah, I think we could get a few nurses to uh, text in to compare their work to your work exactly. in the technology company. Who says, and who says a nurse is the, most, is the most important job in the world? At times it is. Mm -hmm. Not always it is. Sometimes the person who, for example, you write books. Mm -hmm. Someday, you know, the book you write could bring somebody a lot of entertainment, education and information. That's really important at that time too. Nobody can say that one person is more important than another. And that is what's wrong with the attitude as well. Just go write that book now, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not saying I'm that important. <laughs> but, uh, but at times... I can be, yeah, I'm sure I can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah, my yeah. point. Everyone has their own role in this world and for somebody to belittle your role or say, I'm more important than this person or this person's more important, that is what feeds into attitudes and it feeds into, in a really, really abstract way, it feeds into othering people, which is why we have things like racism, mm. misogyny, homophobia. Mm. And look, golfers are very well rewarded, but still, because they, of that, Jordan Speed stood on the 12th hole in Augusta with probably 150 million people watching yeah. and laughing at him, essentially. Yeah. They're very well rewarded, but they're still human beings. They still, still laugh, feel like they? the way me and you. They still don't like being criticised. They still have to carry that home. They still have to bring home the bacon one way or another. It might be a lot of bacon compared to what we're used to, <laughs> but the more money you have, the more outgoings you have too. <laughs> the irony of Mayo supporters singing a song made famous by a Galway band. Says there Lee. we go. Well, listen, hopefully you're singing it again in September. That's yeah. all well, I, think I think it's, uh, it's definitely, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, definitely. We, yeah. we got to wrap it up. Uh, Gavin Cooney, more Trasny Kelly, Owen Butler, thanks a lot for joining us in the studio. Uh, that'll all be up on offtheball.com if you want to have a listen back. Quick break, and then we're talking football with Gary Breen. Join that conversation. Text us on 53106. Texts cost 30 cent. With Harvey Norman's interest-free finance options, you can get what you really want today. Fill out a simple application in less than 10 minutes and you could get approval just 15 minutes later. It's that easy. And with interest-free finance terms ranging from 18 months to up to three years, we'll have a repayment schedule that suits you. Apply online or visit your local Harvey Norman today. What would you get? No. Terms and conditions apply subject to assessment. Finance provided by Creation Consumer Finance Limited and Flexify Europe Limited. For full terms and conditions, visit harveynorman.ie forward slash finance. Woohoo! Brain cells! Why is Hunch pretending to ride a horse? It's the Grand National Festival. I know, but he's not usually this happy. He's just seen Betway's latest odds on the Grand National Festival. Ah, no wonder. Hunch loves getting something back. Woohoo! He's not going to try and jump that, is he? No. Yeah! Oh. Yes. Heed your hunch with Betway at the Grand National Festival. Bet responsibly. 18 plus. For support and information, see dunlouis.net. Business is changing, which is why at Ford, when we say our commercial vehicles are built for business, we mean it. Our new transit range is still tough, still powerful and always dependable. But it now has the brains to match its superior brawn. With an even wider range of innovative features, smart technologies and greater efficiency. It's designed to work as hard as you do. And with Ford Innovate driving better value, you can get 3.9% APR, a five-year warranty and a 2000 euro bonus on the new Ford Transit range. Your business deserves the best in the business. Choose Ford Transit, the future of commercial vehicles. Order now at your local participating Ford dealer and register by April 30th. Ford, go further. Terms and conditions apply. See Ford.ie for details. When you get a new home, or even one that's not so new anymore, it can be hard to know where to start to make it your own. Maybe with those horrific tiles in the downstairs bathroom, or that trippy carpet in the upstairs bathroom, the one the previous owners put down before you were even born. Yep, bathroom carpet. Whatever your plans, when it comes to your first home, start by talking to the Ulster Bank Mortgage Team to see how we could help. Talk to us today. Ulster Bank. Help for what matters. Over 18s and residential mortgages only. Ulster Bank Ireland DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. La mer. Set sail on Irish Ferry's brand new WB8s direct from Dublin to Cherbourg and experience somewhere not quite so new, Normandy. Normandy has it all. The D-Day beaches, the Bayou Tapestry, Mont Saint-Michel and truly delicious food and wine. Bring your car.